when I spoke to you on New Year's Eve, I mentioned that I was going to broach the topic of rumours that have been emanating about a particular member of the royal family, unsavoury rumours. And uh, that's what we're going to get into today, the time has come. I mentioned that I'd been away to Norfolk over the perineum. The perineum is that time of year between the two dots in the undercarriage of the year, between Christmas and New Year. That's the perineum, if you didn't know, now you do. I was in Norfolk visiting friends. As you may know, Norfolk is the home of the Sandringham Estate, beloved of the Queen, and of course of Anne Anma Hall, which is Catherine and William's country residence. They live there part-time when they're not at Kensington Palace. It's also home to a particular kind of set. They've come to be known rather vulgarly in the press as the turnip toffs. The turnip toffs are the friends, family and acquaintances of those who run in aristocratic circles in Norfolk, particularly North Norfolk and the surrounds. And the two families I stayed with while I was in Norfolk fall under this umbrella. And no, I'm not saying that I was staying at either Anmer Hall or Houghton Hall, but in those surrounds, in that vicinity, with connections of connections, friends of friends. I've been asked in the comments so many times for my commentary on the rumours that surfaced a couple of years ago and have been resurfacing over the past week or two about Prince William and the alleged affair that's been ongoing with Rose Hanbury. And I didn't want to address it for two reasons. One, because of the sophistry involved, how mucky the whole idea is. And uh, secondly, because there are certain things that one can't discuss with one's contacts on the phone in the same way that one can when one is in person, uh, person to person, with people in the know, people who I trust to give me their point of view. And I was able to do that last week, which is why it was a good opportunity for me to dig in and get a good sounding with those who I trust. Before I give you my insights into the whole thing, I must say to you that I am not the guardian of Rose Hanbury's vagina. I'm not Big Willie's chaperone either. Le chaperon de la coque de Grand Guillaume. Only her orifice or orifices and his appendage would be able to give you the unbridled, unadulterated truth. So all I can offer you is what I've learned from those who have intimate connections to the Norfolk area and to the general chatter. Now, for the casual viewer who pops along and just wants to get tea without taking long drawn out sips of it, uh, I'm going to get to the point. And then I'll continue for those of you who want to put the kettle on and have a chat about it, okay? So I'm going to state categorically, at the risk of damage to my reputation if this turns out to be in any way untrue, because of the faith that I have in my whisperers, I am going to state here and now categorically that all and any allegations of an affair between Prince William and Rose Hanbury are false, are fabrications, are completely and utterly untrue. They say there's no smoke without fire, in this case, I'm afraid that smoke was dry ice. But what I did discover on my discussions with my friends is that that dry ice, that artificial smoke, could have been one of the first major attempts to smear the reputation of Prince William from that time over years to come. But more on that later. So if that's all you wanted to hear, my take on the subject, whether or not I believe the allegations are true or false. Well, you've got that information now. Do with it as you will. Take it with a pinch of salt. Believe it or don't. I couldn't care less, but uh, there you have it. Uh, but for the rest of you who just like to have a chat with me, some of you will have heard these rumours, some of you won't, some will know the history, some won't. So I will run, run through a bit of the history and uh, give you some more detail into my findings. Who is Rose Hanbury? Well, firstly, her name is Sarah. It's not actually Rose. She goes often by Rose or Rosie to friends, but she's Sarah, Sarah Rose Hanbury. Lovely girl. She is very well connected herself. Her grandmother was the Queen's bridesmaid, one of her bridesmaids, Lady Longman. Actually, at the time of marriage, she was Lady Lambert. That was her maiden name. And uh, she died a few years ago. 
So she was a great confidant of the Queen. The bloodline of the Humphreys runs deep with royalty. Not royal blood as such, but ties to the royal family. It runs deep. She was a pretty young thing, worked quite successfully for a few years as a model, and then she had a whirlwind sort of romance with David Chumley. He's the Marquis of Chumley. Famously, it's written Cholmondley, but it's pronounced Chumley. He's 20 odd years her senior. She's 37 now, he's 61. And on her marriage to him, she became the Marchioness of Chumley. David Chumley is one of the most delightful men you could ever meet. He is so sweet. He's so gentle-natured. And he's descended from Robert Walpole, who was the first Prime Minister of Great Britain. And Houghton Hall, where, which is the family's home, was built for Walpole. And it is a truly stunning place of residence. You can see footage of it on YouTube. It's beautiful. It's Palladian in style, with the most richly well-preserved furnishings and artefacts. And Lord Chumley has actually brought a modern touch here and there, uh, not to the detriment of the hall interiors, but outside in the garden, lots of modern sculpture, beautifully done. Stunning interiors by William Kent, it really is worth a look on online. And it is close by to Anmer Hall, where Catherine and William live. It's about four miles from there. He's also descended from the Rothschilds, which I'm sure will delight conspiracy theorists, theorists out there. The Rothschilds and also the Sassoons. I don't think Vidal Sassoon himself, but <laughs> he's a filmmaker amongst other things. And he goes by the name David Rock Savage or Rock Savage, uh, David Rock Savage. And it, it reminds me actually, was it Kate Winslet who married that guy, Ned Rock and Roller, something like that, something rock and roll, where this guy had uh, formed and fabricated a surname to give him some kind of rock star edge, which I thought was rather naff, I've got to tell you. Well, uh, this uh, Rock Savage name, Sounds as if it was invented in a similar name. But no, it is an actual, it's derived, his professional name, David Rock Savage, is derived from his title, Earl of Rock Savage, as he was before he became the Marquis of Chumley. And before that, he was actually styled Viscount Malpas. But David Chumley is connected to Her Majesty because he is the Lord Great Chamberlain to Her Majesty and has been since 1990. And that's a hereditary position totally unpaid. And it's often confused actually with the office of the Lord Chamberlain of the Household, which is the one which you'll hear about more often. The Lord Chamberlain of the Household has much more involvement with Her Majesty's day to day. In fact, the current one is uh, the Baron Parker of Minsmere, Andrew Parker. Uh, he's a former British intelligence officer. But I digress, that's quite separate from David Chumley's role. And as the Lord Great Chamberlain, he has charge over the Palace of Westminster, which is the Houses of Parliament that you, you often see on the news. And you'll see him at state openings and closings of Parliament, that kind of thing, bearing the sword of state. He also has the distinct honour uh, when it comes to coronations. Obviously, there hasn't been one for quite some time. And I assume, even though he was appointed by Queen Elizabeth, I assume that he will still be installed uh, with that role when Prince Charles ascends the throne to become king. But he'll have the great honour of serving King Charles Water <laughs> before and after the coronation banquet. I wonder if they'll add a little bit of uh, a sprinkling of something else into the water to calm King Charles's nerves, but he has that honour. He has the right to dress King Charles on the day of the coronation, and he'll have some involvement with investing King Charles with the insignia of rule. So I'm just trying to put in perspective and capture for you how deeply seated they are within ties to royalty, how far their bloodlines go back, how trusted this couple are. One of the reasons that royalty resist making friends and acquaintances, well I'm speaking about William and Catherine here, let's not mention Eugenie and Beatrice and the Yorks. I understand that their work and career takes them far afield, but do I think it's prudent for royals to go around befriending celebrities? No, I don't. And it's not just modern royals that do it, Princess Margaret did as well. <laughs> 
to name but a few, I'm sure many have. Thankfully, William and Catherine have never been tempted in that direction. A few characters on the periphery are one thing, and they may exist for all royals. I'm not saying there aren't associations, but I'm talking about the close fold of intimacy where confidences are shared and where people can truly be trusted. They're few and far of these people that can be trusted. So families such as those of Rose Hanbury and David Chumley, where two trusted families come together as a couple. These are the kind of families and circles that can be trusted upon. Although having said that, I have been told that actually the bonds between the Cambridges and the Chumleys aren't that strong. They have a passing acquaintance. There's been some to and fro between the houses, dinners between the couples. But actually, I'm told that there isn't a particular close kinship between the two couples. They're not chucking car keys into a bowl anyway, let's put it that way, and swinging round chandeliers. It'd be fabulous if they were, I've got to tell you, but uh, from my estimation that's not the case. But this set of so-called posh friends of Catherine and Williams, part of the aristocratic circle, known as the turnip toffs. Toffs, I don't know if you know this expression abroad, but toffs are posh people, the upper class posh people, toffs. And turnip, one can only assume, comes from the fact that it's out in the country where vegetables are grown and eaten, I guess, I, I don't really know. But the turnip toffs, of course, they include the Chumleys, but also other sets of well-born friends of William and Catherine. And also the godmother to Prince Louis, Laura Mead, James and Laura Mead. They're, they're another one of that, that kernel of the set of the, the turnip toffs. I believe there was a spell when Catherine and Rose grew a little closer over their connection to East Anglia Children's Hospice. They were both doing charity work together for the hospice, and that's what drew them even closer into each other's radar for a while. I'm told that they still see each other occasionally, and they like each other. Prince William and David Chumley like each other very much. So for those of you that don't know, rumours really came to the surface, and the heat was on, I think this was in 2019. And, you know, it beggars belief that any credence was given to these rumours where you find out the source material. The source for these apparent insider scoops was an American publication called In Touch. But uh, from what I could see and uh, what's been written, they're constantly accusing people of being pregnant, including Catherine supposedly with her fourth child, and there's a sort of slightly dubious looking photo there with an alleged belly. Apparently they're always accusing people of being pregnant at Arda, including Jennifer Aniston, who's spoken out on the subject because she's constantly <laughs> being told that she's pregnant. You know, I'll flash up a few of the rather ludicrous headlines and front cover stories I've seen, including the Prince William one, just to give you the gist of this is the only source where this has come from. And of course, I'm going to caveat that by saying that apparently there were whispers before this came up. Apparently everybody knew, like apparently everybody knew, my dear, everyone in society knew that Prince William was having an affair. Well, as I say, I'm not privy to their genitalia, are you? I'm not privy to their bedrooms, are you? So when people say they know things, when courtiers and insiders say they know things, how much can they actually really know? I mean, one of the grassy knolls of this whole debacle is the fact that apparently William's been catching helicopters three times a week from London to Norfolk. I, it beggars belief. Does it not occur to these people who are reeling off this piece of reportage that Anma is in Norfolk? London to Norfolk. I, that hardly throws up huge amounts of suspicion in my mind. I don't know about you. Because it doesn't say that the helicopters were coming into some landing pad at Houghton Hall, which is the family home of the, not only the Chumleys, but all of their children, all of their staff. William was smuggling himself in three times a week for a good old session and a good old party. That's what, that's what the insinuation is. Now, another headline said the Harkles were suing the Queen. Not rumoured to be, not alleged to be, but actually suing the Queen. 
So I had to mention that. Just for those of you who aren't particularly interest, all that interested in royalty, don't follow it that avidly. When you see these rumours surface, because they will continue to resurface and resurface, it's the favourite thing to bash William with at the moment, amongst others, just bear in mind where it came from. An article from In Touch magazine with undisclosed sources. Okay, so I'll just mention that for what it's worth. And what In Touch magazine reported that sources were saying was that not only apparently William was cheating on Catherine, but also that it was during the time of her pregnancy, when she was pregnant with Louis, her third child. And what found the flames, unfortunately, is that Prince William is said to have taken legal action at that time, which is quite rare, uh, a rare step, not unheard of, but a fairly rare step for a royal to do, especially in regards to a magazine like that, which is obviously not widely respected or taken seriously, but it, it is uh, reported that he took legal action. And it wasn't only that publication, but it's also reported that at least one British publication was also approached by the Queen's lawyers, or I should say a favourite of the Royals. Uh, the Royals' lawyers are Harbottle and Lewis. And it was reported that one of the letters from Harbottle and Lewis states that in addition to being false and highly damaging, so they've stated unequivocally that it is false rumour, false and highly damaging, the publication of false speculation in respect of our client's private life also constitutes a breach of his privacy, Prince William's privacy, presumably, pursuant to Article 8 of the European Convention to Human Rights. So those who wish to attack William and Catherine have taken this, uh, this action as proof of William's guilt. He wants to hush everything up, wants to quiet things, shut everything down. Well, I spoke about this with my friends and it became very clear that William only took that sort of drastic action, if you will, because these rumours involve not only him, but they're very hurtful to Catherine, to their children. Uh, you know, the very thought that Louis could grow up to think that his father had been sleeping around while he was in Catherine's body. Uh, and also, out of respect to the, the Chumleys, I would imagine that that came into it as well. William, like all the members of the royal family, are completely used to seeing lies and mischief making and uh, all kinds of scandals about them, and some truths, I'm sure, but completely used to that. But uh, this particular story crossed the line and it had to be squashed. Prince William is a family man. He is the epitome of a family man. Prince William is so at home with not only Catherine, Katie Coos, not only Kate, but also her family, the Middletons. He wouldn't jeopardise what he has with her and her extended family for the world. The very thought that he would be playing around in particular while Catherine was pregnant with Louis is laughable, if it wasn't so gloomy and sad to think about, is laughable. But there is such a negative force out there of interlopers with sinister motives that people start believing these things and they're thousands and hundreds of thousands until they become just sort of wrote off as fact in the Twitter sphere. William is a loyal and loving father and that's plain to see to all of us with any common sense. In fact, William's goodness shines. It shines so bright that this is what I want you to consider, my dears. For those voices, and there are many of these voices, and they're getting more cacophonous as time goes by, more cacophonous in the age of social media as that grows, more cacophonous in the era of disinformation. Prince William shines so bright that he is of major concern to those who wish to see the monarchy, the establishment, fall. Major concern. Why? Prince Charles was, he was manna from heaven because 
Although there's many of us that really like Prince Charles, there's many of us that don't. Especially abroad, there's many of those that just can't forgive him for his perceived behaviour towards Diana. She's forgiven for everything, of course. But, you know, this was manna from heaven for those who are waiting for the moment that Her Majesty expires. Waiting for that moment. You know, I mean, it's going to get crazy, my dear. This is the moment that they want to wipe out monarchy. And they might succeed. But... William and Catherine with a chump, trump, chump? William and Catherine with a trump card, my dear. Because as lengthy as Her Majesty Elizabeth II's reign has been, Charles's, unless he pulls off some major miracle of cryogenic suspension, is not going to be quite so lengthy. Probably to his great joy, because actually what I've been told is that, uh, and what I've learned, is that Prince Charles is very reluctant to actually become king anyway. And I've heard that also from Princess Diana's own lips, if you watch the Panorama interview. She says just that. She says that uh, actually if only people knew uh, how reserved he is about taking on that role, he'd rather remain Prince of Wales in that role. But of course, it's his destiny to become king, but following on sweet fairly rapidly, when compared to Elizabeth, will be William. And people, until very recently, uh, you know, he's still extremely popular. Let's not get it twisted. He and Catherine are doing sterling work. But that noise coming from those who oppose the monarchy, oppose the royal family, have set him firmly in their sights, even more so than Charles. Because perhaps they feel the public will put up with Charles and Camilla for a few years, because we know that we've got gorgeous William and Catherine coming up the rear, so to speak. But there is a vengeance for Prince William, and you, my dears, are going to be seeing this in spades over the next few years. In spades. It has begun. The attack on that lovely family man and his wife, who never put a f rarely put a foot wrong, like the Queen. Shining examples of everything that you could be. What do those detractors have to do in the Twitter sphere? Disinformation, disinformation, disinformation. This is why they got down on their knees and kissed the floor when Meghan and Harry turned their backs on the royal family and made that spiteful, malicious Oprah Winfrey interview where they insinuated racism within the major ranks of the royal family. It was a disgusting thing to do. It was a disgusting thing to do while the world was still smarting from everything to do with the George Floyd incident and the BLM protests, everything that emerged after that. And there were good things, good reckonings that emerged in the aftermath of that incident. And there were also bad, sinister, nasty, nasty things where opportunists have taken their chance to cause mischief and mayhem. And I'm sad to say that those mischief makers include Harry and Meghan, because even in the wake of that raw time, they took it upon themselves, the both of them, to damage their close family members and the monarchy by putting the cloud of suspicion on them, of being bigots and being prejudiced. They handed over symbolic weapons to damage their own family to those that would do great harm to that institution. And you see, that is the difference. There are so many unpleasant rumours emerging about Catherine and William. I mean, because of the content I make and when I'm researching stories, I see what's said about them, the vile stuff on, on, uh, online and on social media. It's really heartbreaking. There is a lot of hatred for them. And it's all based on completely false information. And you might say, well, River, you don't like Harry and Meghan. And you're, you're just uh, basing your dislike of them in the same way that others might do towards the Cambridges. Well, no, actually, no. I was always very keenly aware that rumour abounds on both sides. And it was only when I saw with my own eyes and heard with my own ears Harry and Meghan spitefully assassinating their own family on national TV. You know, there was no gossip or rumour. I saw it. I heard it. And that's when I knew, you're nasty. And even, and this is a real stretch of the imagination, but even if what they claimed was true, that there, were, there was some conversation where there was genuine concerns about the colour of their children, which as we've all seen is um, extremely white, 
even if that was true, that something nasty had been said, it's still my volition that that matter could have been handled privately. There was no reason for Harry especially to allow that interview to damage the entire family and the entire institution. No excuse whatsoever. Whereas all the rumours about William and Catherine, they are all just speculation. So do bear in mind that I built my ideas about the Harkles on footage, not just speculation. I based them on actual footage that I've seen. When I see Catherine labelled as a racist on social media, that is pure speculation. You've never seen one word from her lips denigrating anybody of any colour, any creed. Even before we knew about the whole Meghan and Catherine incident, we heard that she had had the good grace as future queen to offer Meghan an apology and flowers to try and make nice for whatever was tittle-tattle was going on between the pair of them. That is the person she is. So much of this vitriol towards William, this unpleasantry, has been undeniably exacerbated by Meghan and Harry. And I know that there are certain rumours that it was Harry and Meghan that began spreading this all this talk about Rose Hanbury and William together. And I did ask around about this to see what juice I could get hold of. Now, to be fair to the Harkles, I'm told that it is not believed, as some have rumoured, that the Harkles have put this information out there, at least not explicitly. I have been told, uh, and this isn't pointing the finger at Harry, but I have been told that he's extremely free with his words uh, within the households. There's a lot of talk of households, the camps, and that he, because we've all seen the way that he's ingratiating with celebrities and uh, whoever he deems to be cool at the moment alike, he's quite ingratiating, he's quite free with his tongue. So there's certain things that he might have said, even in humour, here and there, that were taken as fact, misinterpreted, carried. You know, this has led to the point where we have madmen scaling the walls of Windsor Palace and trying to kill the Queen with a crossbow on Christmas Day. I mean, you couldn't make it up, could you? This is Queen Elizabeth, who served faultlessly for 70 years. In the year of her husband's death, she's just lost about four friends in the last month, and someone's trying to break in and kill her with a crossbow because he's avenging racism. Talking about a madman here. So that puts a completely different spin on things, but all I'm saying is, would he be doing this? Would these eruptions be happening if the insinuation of racism hadn't been put out there by Harry and Meghan? You know, there are some I've spoken to that hold them, that hold those two actually responsible for the repercussions like we saw at Windsor Castle a couple of weeks ago. And, and you know, I've really thought about that and I don't find it to be unfair. I mean, I have to have a word with the, the madman in question, but it's not entirely unfair to suppose that. I do wonder how the Harkles would have felt and if they would have felt any twinge of guilt had that mission been successful. Uh, perish the thought. But there is talk that Harry can be a little too candid, and candid talk is currency in royal circles. Some can be trusted within palace walls, in fact more than are given credit, but then there are the servants, whether it's Princess Diana's so-called rock, or uh, many of the confidants, Queen Elizabeth the Queen Mother, I'm sure they've all been rocked in some way or the other by servants with loose lips. It happens. Money talks, I'm afraid, sometimes, but and candid comments from a royal such as Harry or Meghan are currency. But in fairness to the Harkles, what I'm told is that it is more likely that the whispers did not emerge expressly from the Harkles, but more certain camps it might be in cahoots with other camps that wish to do damage to William's reputation. And the truth is that there's no nasty shit going on regarding William. So they have to invent shit, chuck it at him, and hope some of the shit sticks. And that's what they're doing. That's what they will continue to do. But it didn't escape my attention that this resurfacing of this silly story came out within the same few hours, I believe, that I was reading about William's new homelessness venture, various plans that he had to build that enterprise. And uh, within a very short time, these 
articles started emerging. And it was the same evening that people started chattering about this alleged affair again, which I thought, hmm, interesting timing there. But this anti-establishment faction, I hesitate to use the word left wing because I have beloved friends from the left, the right, and all in between those who don't particularly associate or label themselves either. But hopefully you know what I mean. I'll, I'll say anti-establishment anyway. But there is this faction that, you know, they want to bring down the monarchy and they're using these Twitter mobs, these pylons, to make these tiny voices, these uh, minority of the minorities, heard. This is the age of the rise of the mediocre. It's the rise of the mediocre, these mediocre people. And I'm not saying that everyone who's against the monarchy or anti-establishment is mediocre, not at all. Some of them have truly val valid points and worthy ones. Uh, that isn't the point I'm making. I'm just saying that in the social media age, these mediocre ones, they would never have been able to organise in the same way with other mediocres out there to create this sense of propaganda. Do you see how it works? Charles was never universally liked, but William was. William really was. He's still greatly liked and respected, but there's just a much more vocal opposition now. And it has to be said, looking back, that it seemed to begin its acceleration when these false rumours of the Hanbury affair began to emerge and were further exacerbated by the Harkles' efforts. Uh, since those rumours emerged in 2019, they've been photographed at church in Sandringham with David and Rose, looking perfectly comfortable in each other's company. In that In Touch magazine article, the original one, it said, and how they knew this, I don't know. There must be some serious flies on the wall at Anne Hall. But they reported something along the lines that Catherine had confronted William about the affair and William had laughed it off and said ha, 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 don't be silly how would they know that I don't know you know unless they had somebody the other side holding a glass to the wall I don't know how they managed to extrapolate that information but apparently they did not but yeah they've been seen out and about in each other's company and actually the Hanbury girl was invited along to the state dinner when President Trump was hosted by the Queen and I believe they were seated fairly closely to William and Catherine so that doesn't sniff to me of any kind of scandal. So I hope you got something out of this chit chat. No major revelations, but that's because there are no major re revelations. The people I've spoken to, mainly those based in Norfolk, those with really quite solid connections and their family with solid connections, particularly parents. Parents are very useful, you know, they can be particularly gossipy. And some of the grannies, excellent source of information, those grannies, because grannies love me and I love them. So uh, they're always splendid for a little gossip. But, you know, it's quite difficult for me really to unpack what, what I want to share with you, what I can share with you. And I don't want to appear enigmatic, but obviously there's certain things and people that I just cannot share with you to protect myself and to protect them. But those who have watched and known me know that I will drop in nuggets, what I call my little nuggets, my tidbits of information, where I can, how I can and you're just going to have to do your best to find them and be illuminated by them as we go along. So I hope you appreciate that I was asked for my perspective and uh, I've given it. I have every faith in Prince William. I have every belief with the understanding that I'm not the oracle, that I'm not privy to what goes on in the four poster beds at either Houghton Hall or Anmore Hall. But that's the truth as I see it. Take it as you will. I hope you're having a lovely start to the new year and I'll chat with you all again soon. Take care, won't you, my dears? Lots of love.